Good evening and welcome everyone to certainly the first of two tastings for this fall at the Lane Public Library. First of all, I want to thank the Friends of Lane Library for making this possible. I sort of have to laugh. I did this as Indian Summer Whites and I should have picked out wines for early winter. It's going to be quite cold tonight. So it should be interesting. Uh, the wine should be well chilled. Oh, and two, before I forget, and I'll try to re remind you at the very end too, tonight is also, again, the beginning of the Jewish High Holidays. And so it's the beginning of a new lunar month. And so the moon is at a 2% crescent. So when we finish tonight, you can go out and toast the moon because we have a new month. And so it would be beautiful to see on this clear, beautiful night in Oxford and surrounding areas with this. Um, if you wanna ask questions, that's fine. Sarah Gifford is here and you can use your chat feature on your computer to uh, send her questions to me and she will then forward them to me from time to time. And I will answer questions typically after we've tasted a wine because I'll try to go back and forth between the presentation and then as we're tasting wines, uh, some of the things that are going on with that, okay? So um, we, uh, uh, and this is also being videotaped. So you know that also, uh, again, you probably know, uh, maybe you can see some other ones, you can see your videos. If you want to get, you know, get rid of your own video or mute your video, you certainly can do that, okay? So let's get started, okay? Uh, first thing I thought I would show you, if it will move, is uh, the wine list. Uh, this is, in fact, the, the wine list that was on uh, the thing, but again, I thought you might want to jot them down, or if you have all the wines, put them in this order. We'll do the Honig first, so you know, Blanc, uh, the La Crema Pinot Gris, and then the Black Stallion Chardonnay, the Sea Glass Riesling, and then finally the Firelands Gewürz Terminer. And so that is the um, sort of the groupings of the wines that we will have. Um, I thought it's always good, I think, to start uh, by being very current au courant, and that is talk about some of the things that are going on in the world of wine. Um, as you all know, I mean, with COVID, which is why we're doing this this evening, um, the world is a little crazy. And certainly California is dealing not only with COVID, uh, but with all of the fires. And so really the 2020 vintage is in balance because some people will not um, be putting out any wine this year. There are a number of wineries who have already announced that because of not so much the fire itself, but the taint that is caused from the smoke that they will not be putting out because they do feel it's so badly tainted. One man said he was going to put out, you know, sort of smoky hand sanitizer that he was going to make from his wine uh, and trying, of course, to break it even. You have to realize this is farming. And so when things like this happen, there is no magic bullet. And so some wineries will have no wine. Uh, interestingly enough, though, too, many, many people, of course, are buying a lot more wine online. And that actually goes even to the world, the upper crust world of wine auctions. And they've been noticing the more young buyers, in other words, under 40, have been, in fact, buying wine at auctions at Christie's and Sotheby's and places like that. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, I thought it was also very neat recently that the um, uh, Napa Valley Vintners have pledged a million dollars towards diversity. Uh, they're working with the United uh, College Negro Fund, or they to uh, give two hundred thousand dollars a year uh, for that. So I thought that was interesting. Otherwise, I mean, the world of wine is crazy. Between the twenty five percent tariffs that have been posted on the Europeans, which has caused them the small wine producers tremendous distress. Um, in Spain, they're doing excessive green harvesting, and the government is paying them for part of that. Uh, in Alsace, they said this is probably one of the very best years ever. They have no rot on the grapes, but even they are reducing their yields simply because they're afraid no one's going to buy the wine. So it is sort of a crazy world uh, to that. So I guess since it is a crazy world, uh, I will show you a few pictures of what's going on. This is actually the socially distanced harvest at Trefethen. Uh, I just found this, in fact, this week. And so you can see all the wine probably uh, it might be early for Cabernet, but it could be Cabernet in there. They never did say uh, on there. And so all of these red grapes, and so you see all the people in the in picking all of those wines there. Um, I was shocked, 120,000 people descend upon Champagne to do the picking because most of it, in fact, is by hand. Uh, and so that is certainly a, a problem with that. And so, um, 
you can see this is at Bollinger, uh, all the people out picking the grapes. And so it's sort of amazing uh, with that. And so uh, again, thought I would show you that's what's going on last week. By the way, some of these pickings in parts of the Loire, they are, it's the earliest picking since 1562. And so that's truly amazing. The other thing that's amazing is, again, because of COVID, this will be the first year since 1827 that some of the wineries will not be treading any of the port by foot, which of course has been the traditional method for them to do it. Um, I thought this was also truly amazing. Um, a, they, these two companies, one in Germany and the other one, oh, no, no, forget, I think in America, have been working together. They recently put out a beer that is at 57.8% alcohol. And I know it was in England. The reason I know this is because it sold out in one day. This is higher than most whiskeys. Uh, I have no idea how they managed to do it, but that was one of the things that I saw that I thought you might find interesting. Um, so again, before we go any further, why don't we taste the first wine? The first wine that we're doing tonight is the Honig Sauvignon Blanc. It's 2019. Um, if you had the bottle in front of you, I think their label is so neat. I mean, not only do I like the label because of the B that's on it, but how they have that back label that shows sort of their vineyard out there. Uh, so again, some things about this wine. Uh, in fact, actually, I'll show you this first. Uh, this is, in fact, their, um, uh, their tasting room and outside. And many people, of course, have moved to outside to do a lot of things with this. Um, uh, this is just some information about the wine itself. It is 96.8% Sauvignon Blanc, so it's not 100%, which is not unusual. It's a blend, but as long as in California, it's above 75%, they can still call it Sauvignon Blanc. To this, they've added 2.7% Sauvignon. Sauvignon is very, very commonly blended, especially in Bordeaux, with Sauvignon Blanc. And so that's not surprising. But look at the third one, 0.3% Muscat. And the reason I mention this is because, again, some of the really bright, lifted aroma that you'll find in this wine comes from that 0.3% muscat. It's almost amazing for those things to happen. Um, again, it's interesting, too, this wine has gone back and forth from being estate grown, and so it'd be Napa, to California. And so they actually do bring in grapes from outside of Napa for this wine now. Uh, they say, of course, harvested during cooler night times, and we'll talk about that, uh, so that, of course, the wine can preserve its inherent aromas and freshness. Uh, all done in stainless steel, using a variety of yeast strains, and we'll mention that in a moment, too. Uh, and then aged on light leaves. In other words, they allow a little bit of the yeast to sit in the tank uh, in stainless prior to blending and bottling. Now, I'm going to try to, let's see, I think I have to stop screen sharing, and then you see me, correct? Is that what happened? I see you. You see me? Hey, good. You see me. All I see is Andrew. And um, so again, uh, this of course is the uh, the bottle, as you probably in fact have it there. And of course, if you pour yourself a little bit of this wine, and I hope you already have, very, very pale in color, very, very light. Of course, it's 19. And as it would age, it would in fact taste, uh, you know, get a little darker. And of course, if you swirl and smell this wine, just wonderful, classic Sauvignon Blanc. It has that really wonderful sort of nectarine, maybe a little Meyer lemon. Mm. And just really that nice sort of dried herbal character to it. So nice, so classic California. In fact, this wine was given 92 points by Williford Wrong, who uh, works for uh, at wine.com uh, and says, in fact, it is, he puts it in his top 15. He finds it's classic. So if we taste this wine. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. What's great is that ripe, fresh flavor that good solid acidity. Meyer lemon almost going into grapefruit in that flavor. Just nice and clean and bright, um, but with really good fruit. And then has that nice herbal finish that will allow it to go really very, very well with the, um, uh, with 
most, you know, really any kinds of foods. Right away, I think of goat cheese. I think of even like a goat cheese tart. I can think of it would even go well uh, with uh, spicy food, uh, nice with sushi, uh, any number of things along those lines. It would be quite, quite nice with. So those are some of the things that I would certainly look for uh, in this wine. I have always found this wine to be an excellent value. I've used it a number of years in class simply because it is classic California Sauvignon Blanc. Obviously, if you're getting it from uh, the Loire, it would tend to be a little more aromatic and a little different. If you're, of course, you're getting it from uh, uh, New Zealand, it would tend to be much more herbal. Uh, and so Sauvignon Blanc can be a fairly um, a versatile grape. And of course, it's blended a lot, especially the great white Bordeaux will have both uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon in them, typically. So again, it just makes a, a great wine and really nice along those lines. If I go back to, going back to uh, share screen and, no, where am I? Oh, here. There you go. Uh, so again, uh, what I thought I would talk about, some uh, obviously is white winemaking as we're sipping the wine. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about white winemaking. In fact, how did the wine that is in that bottle get there? Uh, and I won't take a whole lot of time, but again, one of the most important things is harvesting. And the question is, do you harvest by hand or do you harvest by machine? This, of course, is hand harvesting, and this is night harvesting, and this is not unusual. In fact, I had a student who, uh, that was his job. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let him do the important job of picking, but he could drive the tractor with the lights over top so that they, of course, could pick the grapes as they're going. Because again, if you pick at night, it's like why we keep things in the refrigerator. Less chance of spoilage, uh, less chance of it browning, all of those things. So again, uh, harvesting by hand still done, but less and less especially with COVID, et cetera, even less. Um, the other thing, of course, is machine. And we are finding more and more grapes are being harvested by machine. Again, the important thing about this is that you have to have good fruit, minimum of rot, minimum of any other kind of damage, because you have no sorting table, nothing like that to, to take out uh, mog, which is one of my favorite words, material other than grapes, mog. Uh, and so um, this can, of course, be a problem. And so, but machine harvesting is very efficient. And by the way, they actually have shaker bars. And so the grapes are actually shaken off. And so the grape stems, the rachis is still left there, but you do have, in fact, all the berries coming off. And you can find some great videos online of all of that, showing all of that. Um, again, once the grapes come in, uh, typically they, of course, are crushed and destemmed. And this is what you're seeing. These are grapes coming in, uh, going into a crusher destemmer. Uh, these pictures were sent to me just this week. Uh, again, one of my former students is assistant winemaker at Stoller in uh, Oregon. And so he sent me these pictures and that's a sorting table. Um, and so those people are looking at the grapes as they're going past. If they see anything that's unripe or diseased or other material, they can then of course pull it off, throw it to the side. I was so glad he sent me these pictures because this shows you, of course, a far away thing. So you can see the tanks at Stoller covered. And of course, you see the sorting table. And you see that as soon as the grapes get to the end of the table, they fall and they go up uh, along that belt to what is called the crusher destemmer. Because the next thing normally they would do with most grapes, especially white grapes, is take them off of the stems. Sometimes you will, with reds, um, uh, ferment with the stems on, but in this case, with white, you almost never do. And so this is actually what's coming back out of there. Of course, these are red grapes, so it's darker, but these are the stems that are coming out of that crusher destemmer. Typically, they'll compost them or put them back onto the vineyard, and so that's what's going on. So picking the grapes is extremely important when to pick. And of course, it's mother nature. You know, if you're going to have a heavy rain event, um, then you have to pick. I feel badly. I wonder about the people in Virginia and the Carolinas with Sally going through a few days ago, if in fact they had to lift some of the crop off since they were going to get, in some cases, many inches of rain. So these are the problems that you have in making wine. Again, then the grapes go to a press. And you can have what used to be old fashioned, it's a basket press, and this is the kind of presses that have been used for hundreds of years. But again, 
what's old is new again. And so these fancy, beautiful basket presses, you didn't see them 20 years ago in Napa, and now they are everywhere. Typically good for using for smaller amounts. Um, probably the gold standard for this, uh, though, is the bladder press. And in this case, you see there's a there's a almost like an inner tube that has been uh, deflated in there. You put the grapes in there. You may put some um, material to keep the grapes apart, uh, which we call a press aid, in there also. You fill it in. You close the tank, and then of course you expand the balloon. And by expanding the balloon, you can do a nice gentle pressure on those grapes because especially with white, you don't want to get a strong press because you can break down the seeds or break down the skins and get tannins and off flavors and aromas. So you want good gentle pressing and, uh, and the bladder does a really good job of that. And so this is why it's pretty much a standard in the industry. Some of them have the same thing that are almost continuous presses, but these are pretty much industry standards, especially for sort of better winemaking in all of that. The next thing that's critical is settling. And that is as soon as you get the juice out of the press, the next thing is going to have, it's going to have a tremendous amount of particulate matter. It's still going to look like orange juice. The problem is that particulate matter can cause a lot of off flavors and aromas. So the next thing you want to do to make a good white wine is let it settle. And that means you'll put it in probably cold storage, to 40 degrees or so, and simply allow the particulate matter to settle out. Uh, these are actually, you can see pictures of juice settling, and they actually can use certain materials that will improve the settling. And so you get typically 12 hours, 24 hours, or whatever, where you then will allow the, the material to settle out, and then you will rack. Racking is so important. In other words, what you'll do is you will take that now clean juice off of the lees. The lees are, of course, there's the gunk that's on the bottom. Uh, that's a scientific term. And, uh, and so it's left. And so now you have relatively clean juice that you can start the main event with. But before we get to the main event, why don't we try another wine, okay? The second wine we're trying today is the La Crema uh, from Monterey. And it's 2018 Pinot Gris. Um, and Pinot Gris is a very interesting grape. Uh, I will pour, but let's talk about the wine first, and then we will talk about tasting it, okay? Um, this, of course, is uh, their tasting room, which they put in uh, at Sara Lee's Vineyard. Again, absolutely gorgeous picture. Uh, makes you want to travel. Hopefully, we will be able to again soon uh, with all of that. Uh, it's 100% Pinot Gris in this case. Uh, and it is um, uh, in 97% stainless and 3% neutral oak barrel. The neutral oak barrel probably softens the wine just a little bit, and so that's why they use it. And again, again, titratable acidity, 0.55, which is, I would say, sort of up there, not super high, but very good. pH is normal, about 3.4, alcohol 13.8% uh, in there. Um, and again, before we taste the wine, Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris is the pink. Gris is actually, of course, French for gray. And that's because very often with other pictures, you'll see it looks sort of pinkish gray. This is the pink variety of Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a, is a very ancient grape and it's very, very apt to mutate. And so consequently, you have Pinot Gris, you have Pinot Blanc, you've got Pinot Meunier, there, and there are all kinds of clonal adaptations of it also. And so this is Pinot Gris, and it's typically made into a white wine. Occasionally, you'll see it a bit more golden, and sometimes, just rarely, a little bit pink, okay? So let's, uh, let's take a minute and taste this wine. Uh, again, you see this color is darker, and Pinot Gris tend to be that way, tend to be a little darker in color, not to mention it has another year on it uh, than the Honig did. And again, beautiful golden color if you swirl it. If you swirl and smell this wine, I just like Pinot Gris. They, they really are, it's more white peach, uh, uh, sort of softer aromas, uh, to it, more sort of broad, uh, not as sharp as the Sauvignon Blanc was. Oh yeah, and it almost has a little bit of a, boy, almost a spicy, almost a cinnamon note in there, sort of a spicy uh, peaches or apples. Huh, very neat. Oh yeah, almost clovey. 
Wow, have you tasted this wine? Mm. Broader on the palate, um, nice finish, decent acidity, ends up almost a little, almost a little bit of marmalade in that flavor or the feeling that you get in that, you know, with that flavor that's there. Mm. Quite, quite tasty uh, uh, with that. So it makes it really a, a very, very nice wine. Uh, I think I have some other information about this, so I will go back. Uh, oh, actually, uh, are there any questions on chat, uh, Sarah? I don't see any. You None? Might, you might have to ask folks to click on the chat okay. button at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Uh, Sarah said to click on the chat button at the bottom of the screen if you have any specific questions. Uh, and, um, and certainly if you do, I will stop uh, after other, other, other ones also. Okay. Back to share screen. Oh, yes. Thank you. I will do that. Okay. Now, where did it go, Andrew? I must have shared wrong. Stop sharing, go back. Yep, I did that. Uh, here, in the green. Sorry, folks, my mistake. And they're figuring out the chat. Good. Uh, they would like to know what would be a good cheese or food pairing with the Pinot Gris. I don't know if they can hmm. the question. Uh, the question was about a wine or pa food pairing with the Pinot Gris. You know, I think because it's sort of softer and has more uh, sort of a broad thing, um, I really think that you could do, uh, I think it's got enough oomph that you could actually do, uh, especially this time of year, pork tenderloin with apples or something like that, or, you know, or, you know, even obviously chops uh, with apples or maybe cherries or pears. I just find that pork and fruit, and I think with this having very much sort of the same flavors, but yet with a, a little bit of acidity would sort of really just complement that very, very nicely. So right off the top of my head, that's the first place I would go uh, with that. You could certainly do, uh, certainly, I mean, isn't so strong, you could not do chicken. Uh, and actually, because a little bit of sweetness, it would be interesting to see how scallops would be, or lobster. Uh, and I certainly think you could do seafood that way also. Um, I don't see salmon as much unless you did something, again, with some kind of glaze uh, on it that it would work. But yeah, so you could certainly do any of those things. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think, vegetarian, you know, again, I think just the vegetables would go right away. I think of, you know, some of the zucchini recipes are out here right now would be really good with that also. So again, those are some of the things that I would, that I would pick with that. So uh, let's uh, continue on a little bit into our wine. We settled those, we settled that juice, and now we're, of course, going to ferment it. In many cases, though, and trust me, with our current, the way the climate change is happening, uh, this is probably needed less and less, and that's chapitalization. Chapitalization is the addition of sugar, because again, the main event, of course, is fermentation, which is changing the sugar into alcohol. And chapitalization, again, was, was found by Jean-Antoine Chateau who was uh, one of Napoleon's ministers. And it was he who came up with the idea that if you added sugar to the juice, it would increase the alcohol, which, and this is, by the way, before Pasteur. So we didn't really understand fermentation as we did after good old Louis. Uh, and, so, and so consequently, if you have a vintage that doesn't have enough sugar, isn't ripe enough, but the flavors are good, but it needs more sugar, this is one of the things that often is done. It's illegal in warm countries, illegal in California, illegal in Australia, but it's widely legal throughout, obviously, the Northeast, uh, United States, and in most of Europe, to varying amounts. Obviously, typically, the fur further north you go, the more chapitalization that they will allow, okay? So finally, we get to the main event, and that's fermentation. Fermentation, of course, using yeast, and many, many yeast can do a fermentation, but the main one, again, is saccharomyces, and you see saccharin, you see the word sugar in there, uh, and it's because it is a yeast 
that can literally live in high amounts of alcohol. And so it can ferment up to that 12, 13, 14, 15% alcohol to give you a biologically stable product. In other words, wine. And grapes are the only ones that will do that. You can ferment other things and alcohol will be made, but not to that great amount. Uh, and not all the time. I mean, let's face it, grapes are little sugar bombs and can easily have 25, 30% sugar. And so you'll find that even the grapes, because I've tried, I've checked them out at Kroger, even the table grapes at Kroger can be 15% uh, sugar. And so very, very high in sugar. So that's one of the things that goes on with this. Fermentation, again, simple definition, uh, just to remember, a breakdown of a complex material and something simpler through the action of an organism. In other words, you have to have something. And we would not, I mean, think about how empty our lives would be without fermentation. Of course, not only would we not have wine, but also certainly much of beer, cheese, bread, antibiotics, composting. I mean, you name it, we all depend so much on fermentation. Pickles, sauerkraut. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And by the way, fermentation has become very trendy in the last year, of course. And who isn't making sourdough bread at the moment? I think everybody. Uh, and so consequently, um, it's very, very important. Yeasts, of course, make ethanol in the absence of oxygen. Normally, if you could give the yeast tons of, of oxygen, it would break down that sugar into nothing but carbon dioxide and, and water. What a waste. And so instead, in the absence of oxygen, then it switches pathways. And so the final byproduct of that is, of course, ethanol, uh, which, of course, I never forget, is a poison in when overused. And of course, that's eventually what can kill the yeast and stop the fermentation when the alcohol gets too high. It's omnipresent. As you see on those grape berries, it is covered with yeast. There are probably millions, if not billions of yeast cells on those grapes. Creepy, huh? And of course, that's the same as when you buy them at Kroger. But of course, we have organisms living all over us and all of your surfaces. I don't care how often you sanitize, they're there uh, with this. And of course, this is what they look like. And of course, they break off for the most part and they're able to to recreate under the right circumstances or procreate in amazing numbers uh, in there. And in fact, they go crazy early on in the juice because you have dissolved oxygen. And so they expand their numbers tremendously and in fact, until they use up the oxygen. And then of course, um, then they begin producing ethanol. And so that's what happens. By the way too, the other byproducts, which I haven't mentioned are heat, and so especially with white wine making, you want a cool fermentation. And so that's why 55 to 60 degrees and carbon dioxide, a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. And in fact, wineries are now looking at carbon capture because they do know that they put out a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide in the fermentation process. There's simply no doubt about that. So why don't we try the third wine? Wine number three is the Black Stallion, as you see here on your screen, uh, at a, a state winery uh, on the Silverado Trail. And again, uh, some things about this winery. Here, of course, is the beautiful winery, uh, open, of course, currently by appointment only. Uh, but you can see, of course, there, and of course, see the Black Stallion there in the middle. Um, uh, each uh, vineyard block was handpicked. Uh, in other words, these again, these wineries, and in fact, even though Black Stallion does say Napa Valley on it, uh, uh, and so there are a number of different blocks within the Napa Valley that they buy, the, that they get the grapes from. And of course, this is always important to remember when it comes to, in fact, making wine. Typically, each one of the blocks are picked separately, and they are vinified separately. The blending doesn't come until later. And so they are, as I said, taken to the winery, pressed into barrels. The barrels, the juice is fermented in barrels. So this is barrel fermentation. Uh, and Jerry left on its primary lees, in other words, the yeast that's there for six months with the barrels being stirred twice a month. That's the French would call that batonnage uh, to increase the creamy texture of the wine. 
once they felt that there were delicate fruit and oak, then the wine was then blended. And you can see vintage 2018, it was aged eight months surly, in other words, on those, ye on those lees. Typically, they take some of them away. You can't have too thick of a layer at the bottom. Predominantly French oak, followed by American, 30% new French. Uh, and again, pH is, uh, you know, normal to a bit high for a typical wine, 3.68. Uh, though good acidity, 0.52, and alcohol again. I mean, and for a Chardonnay, not surprising, 14.5. It's funny, even 25 years ago when I began teaching the course, when you would say how much, what's the typical alcohol in a, in a typical wine, you'd say 12.5%, maybe 13. It has gone up, not because the yeast has gotten better, but we've gotten better at the way we handle things and do things. And so this is why. But again, Alcohol levels have also dropped in wines. We have found time and time again that, that taste change and people are actually looking for wines with less alcohol. And also they're picking earlier because the grapes are phenolically ripe and they want less alcohol. As, you know, so I think that's a good idea uh, for that, okay? Actually, I'll come back to that. Uh, so let's taste this wine. Stop share. Okay, again, uh, if you've poured this wine, as I have, it's sort of, it's very nice how this works. Much more golden in color than the first three. The first one turned out practically white. The first one was a pale straw. This one, I would say, is much close, closer to golden and a really beautiful golden color. Um, and you know, it's funny. You can almost tell, even as it swirls, that there's a almost a little viscosity to that wine. It has a thickness. It doesn't move exactly the same as the first two did uh, with it, which I always find very, very interesting. And if you smell this wine, a completely different animal. I mean, you're getting really nice sort of pear and apple, but there's no question you're getting some of that butteriness, some of that creme brulee nose to it. Yes, you can certainly tell the oak influence in this wine. Very sort of, very full and rich in the nose. And of course, if you taste this wine. Mm, very full bodied. Very buttery. With good uh, again, I see, keep going sort of back to pears in the flavor. Um, maybe a little bit of almonds. Um, what's nice is, and this is this is a pretty oaky wine, and I would be the first person to say that I'm not a huge fan of oak, but what really makes this wine or saves this wine is the acidity. It balances the oakiness in that wine so that it is refreshing. Where if it did not have this good acidity, then it would be cloying. It would be a little too heavy. And so I really think that that's really what makes this wine very nice. It is a uh, little tropical fruits um, in the finish uh, and, um, uh, and a little hot. You know, I mean, obviously you, you can probably feel it a little bit in your throat that it's warming, uh, which on a cold night tonight feels pretty good. Uh, but it really, you know, you can tell that the alcohol is there. Certainly no question about this wine uh, being at 14.5%. Mm, just lovely. Demands a second sip. <laughs> We don't have any questions, but why don't you ask folks if they want to get on okay, the chat? Sure. Thank you. Um, one thing that Sarah did want me uh, to have you do, if you don't have any questions, and certainly if you do, uh, please answer. But if you would, if you just take a second and get on your chat and say how many of them, uh, how many of you are there, and possibly where you're, where you're actually. Uh, at, and that can certainly just be town, doesn't have to be your living room, uh, and, um, and something along those lines, because uh, we'd really like to know sort of where you are, et cetera, and obviously Lade Library would like to know who their supporters are and who is there. So if you would take a moment and do that, she would certainly appreciate it. I'm going to finish telling you about this wine because this wine 
if I can get it to move, aha. Um, got very Alan good knows critical how to do that. Acclaim. It got 90 points right. from Parker. Uh, exactly, Robert Parker probably didn't know his wine advocate. And they say, of course, uh, warm peaches, poached pears, and lemongrass with touches of apple blossom and cedar chest. Uh, medium to full body, the, the palate has a lovely satiny texture, which it does. Good intensity of spice, pear flavors. Finishing on a peppery note. I, I get a, a nice sort of herbal, I'm not sure, peppery, but very nice. And of course, the, it got 90 from the wine enthusiasts. This wine is, is made in a bold, lush style, layered in toasted oak, which is certainly there, golden apple, pear, and cinnamon. A creamy texture, which is certainly also there, rounds out a well-integrated finish. And again, a really very, very nice um, uh, Chardonnay. And I should have looked to see, I'm, I'm sure they make a lot of this wine. Um, uh, but they just do an amazing job. And especially for the price, uh, it, is a, it is an excellent Chardonnay. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so let's see, where were we? We have our wine fermenting. So we've been drinking while the wine has been fermenting. Uh, by the way, this of course is, uh, this is the only, of course, chemistry you'll have tonight. One glucose becomes two ethanol plus two carbon dioxide. Uh, and of course I have there again, glucose uh, to two ethanol with carbon dioxide and heat. Uh, never forget. And of course, as we said, we want to ferment this cool, typically between 50 to 60 degrees. Um, and of course, happening in the absence of air. And so those are the things that come out during or through fermentation. Um, by the way, what you normally see in most whites, these of course were in barrel, but they still probably kept them in a chilled room. Most whites end up being in stainless steel and with a a jacketed tank. And so I put this jacketed tank, you can see the, the bubbles on there. Uh, this tells you in fact that there is a, a cooling jacket on there to in fact monitor the temperature. And this of course is what they do. I mean, luckily of course in this age of computer, uh, people can actually get some sleep. Uh, trust me, winemakers very often didn't seem to get any sleep for a very, very long time and still don't uh, with the amount of work, especially if you have a hot if it's a very hot vintage, the grapes come in because they need to be picked. And so you will be working around the clock. And in many cases at this time, they are working, working around the clock. It is exhausting work, but obviously for many people, extremely satisfying. The other thing that's interesting too is besides using native yeast, most wines, and certainly the wines we're here tonight, I'm sure were cultivated on on yeast that was bought, in other words. And because the kind of yeast that you can use to make a wine will change its flavor, will change its other characteristics, its bubbliness, all kinds of things. And so what you're seeing there is a, what's called a spider diagram. And it shows you how different the exact same juice was fermented using two different yeasts. And the one really brought out the aromas of passion fruit in that wine. And also at the same time, brought out that box hedge or cat urine aroma in there. By the way, this is obviously Sauvignon Blanc. And so that's what you're seeing there with this wine uh, in there. Uh, again, once fermentation is done, you have the dead yeast sitting on the bottom of the tank or the barrel. The next thing you'll want to do is rack. And so you will take that wine now off of the lees and put it into another container. Unless of course you are doing, as you saw with the, uh, uh, with the black stallion, if you wanna do it what is called batonnage or you wanna leave it on the yeast to give it that more rounder, creamier flavor, which you will get in fact from using or leaving it on the yeast or on the lees. And so those are some of the things that are going on uh, with that, okay? By the way, I was lucky enough, it's certainly not the best picture, but I wanted you to see, if you look up in that, that's a Tassevin at the top. And I happen to be at Drun, uh, which is one of the great Burgundy makers. And they were racking barrels of one of their whites. And what he was doing was using, of course they used to use candles. Now they probably use the, uh, they use the, uh, uh, the flashlight on their uh, on their phones uh, and they watch and when the first leaves in other words when the first cloudiness starts to come as you see in there it's a little cloudy then they will stop racking that barrel and take away the rest and this is in fact very often out of that barrel this is what you're left with this is the yeast and all the all the sort of uh, material that has come out of there and so racking is very very important and in many cases, you will rack several times and each time make that wine clearer and cleaner. 
And so that's what's going on with that wine. The next thing that's often done too with this wine is in most cases, and especially with whites, you can't get it clear enough, clean enough with just racking. And so the next thing you will do is fining. And fining, of course, means again, to clear or purify that wine. And in many cases, they will use a fining agent. The most common is a clay called bentonite, though people have used uh, egg whites for hundreds of years and many, many other things. It has to be something that will typically has a charge that will attach itself to the small particulate matter that is in the wine or vice versa. And so it's heavy enough to fall out. So this is what you're seeing. So fining is a method of clearing the wine. And if you're lucky, that's all you need to do to make that wine clean enough to blend and bottle. If not, you have to filter. And of course, may the big boys again do filter. And so those are the next things you're going to see with all of this. So, show you another wine. Uh, the next wine we're having is the Sea Glass Riesling. Um, and I will tell you, this is a Trincaro product. Uh, and this is, of course, 2018. I'll pour myself some. Okay. Uh, yes, it often does. Um, in fact, very. it is funny. A lot of times we just talk about, um, uh, they will simply call it boxwood because it sounds a lot better than cat urine. Uh, but for those of you who have cats and litter boxes, um, that very distinctive, sharp aroma uh, that you will get from a cat, uh, you will often find in Sauvignon Blancs uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Obviously, if it's a lot, it's a flaw. Uh, but in a small amount, unless, of course, you love your cat so much, hey, I'm not, I'm not judging. Uh, and so, uh, and so, um, you will often find that distinctive aroma. And probably again, I will say, and sometimes people will call it jalapeno, that also sounds better. Uh, but uh, especially in some New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, you will get that. And typically, of course, a lot more people say boxwood uh, because it just sounds better than cat urine. In fact, very people said cat pee. I, I've heard that very, very often with it. And so you will find that. But typically, obviously, if it's too much, it's a flaw in the wine. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. On with the show then. Uh, sea glass Riesling. And by the way, this is Monterey County. And uh, let me look on the bottle again. Yeah, I was right. I, I need to look at my things I do. If you look at your bottle, you say it says Monterey Santa Barbara County, because in fact, they actually get like 52% from one and 36% the other. I'm close there, but you know, I'm doing that off the top of my head. I actually might see. Um, beautiful countryside. Down there in Monterey, et cetera, it tends to be cool. I say it tends to be cool since it was recently 110 during the last heat wave, just absolutely unprecedented uh, with this. But beautiful rolling hills, especially towards the Santa Lucia Highlands uh, and some of the areas down in, the, in Monterey. It's just so beautiful. And typically, as I say, cool, like in Santa Barbara. Uh, but again, not always, but that is in fact the norm. Beautiful place. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a Trincaro property, the Trincaro's own Sutter home and many, many other things. They, are, they own uh, many, many wineries. Uh, I thought I would add this picture though. This is the uh, one of the viticulturists. Again, it was really great that they actually sort of gave him the press because again, what happens in the vineyard is so important. You cannot make good wine if you don't have good grapes. Uh, and so overseeing the care of the vineyards is key. And so I was pleased that they sort of had a, a picture of him uh, in there. And so I thought I would add that. Uh, before I go any further, let me stop sharing and we will taste his wine. Okay, so again, uh, surprisingly, a, a little golden in color. I would typically expect a Riesling to be a little bit uh, lighter, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, but again, a, uh, a, a nice light color. If you swirl and smell this wine, it's just, uh, this again, I will tell you, well, two things. One, I've used it very often in class. 
Two, it has often been a, a real class favorite. Because again, you smell that and you get that Riesling grape, maybe a little bit of lime, uh, maybe a little bit chalkiness. Just so fresh and clean and inviting. Makes you salivate. And again, if you taste this wine, It's just delicious. A little bit of sweetness, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but very, very good acidity. Uh, so you don't mind, and on a crisp, cool night like tonight, it makes, it's like the perfect pairing. Um, it's bright, and again, right away, I think, you know, uh, goat cheese or, a, a, you know, a goat cheese tart or a quiche or something like that would go very well. Though you could also do this with sushi. Again, that little bit of sweetness and that good acidity makes it a natural with, um, with spicy, uh, just not too spicy. Um, uh, Asian food uh, can go very, very well with Rieslings. Um, I think they really are underrated as a food wine. Uh, but again, again, I think of like, I make uh, one of my old fashioned recipe I've made for a very long time is actually chicken with grapes. Uh, that have been cooked in a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of cream, and it's just so tasty, uh, and so would really be very good with this Riesling. Uh, so there's lots of things I think that you could pair it with, that it would go very, very well with. So again, really nice little wine. So just, just, it's that wonderful sort of floral overtones, and I don't get, and you thought it was bad with cat pee, so many Rieslings will smell of kerosene, which you know, again, comes and goes. A lot of Germans will be that way. And I don't really get that out of here. I don't get the petrol. There's Another nice thing to say. Yes? There's a question about the acidity of mm -hmm. Riesling. Um, and this is, they tend to be. The wonderful thing about, it, about Riesling as a grape, and I think one of the reasons why it is so um, appreciated by people, and especially the Germans, is because its ability, the grape has the ability to retain acid. And that ability to, to has two things. One, that means that they could, especially in Germany when they would often, they used to, struggle to get the grapes ripe, you could allow them to stay on the vine all the way through September into October. Uh, and the grapes would maintain their acidity, where a grape like Chardonnay loses its acidity fairly quickly. The other thing that makes it wonderful for Rieslings, and it's, it's been a great um, uh, thing to know, is that Rieslings can age, even better in many cases than Chardonnay. And so if you find a Riesling that's three or four or five years old, and if it's a half decent German Riesling from a decent vintage, and you know the producer, 10, 12, 15, 20, and some of the great wines will be wonderful 30, 40, 50 years afterwards. I would love, in fact, if anyone wants to buy me any 71s or 75s or 76 <laughs> Germans, I'd be happy to take them off your hands uh, because I bet they're still drinking beautifully. And those were, in fact, just wonderful years. And even afterwards, the 2001s. I mean, it's always interesting to me, one of the wines that I usually take to the performing arts wine tasting, which unfortunately probably will not happen this year, um, has, in fact, been an older Riesling, 1991. And it's often one of the first wines to go in the premium pours because it's so different and so tasty. So I, I yes, I every time I have a Riesling, it's, it because it's actually sort of a mantra. It's like, why don't I drink more Riesling? Because it is so good and so refreshing. Mm -mm -mm. Tasty. Okay, back we go. Here, there we go. Uh, sea glasses, I put, I want to make sure because the Truncaros um, are, uh, are certainly one of the, they, and it's like Constellation and obviously the Gallows are some of the big producers uh, in um, California, actually uh, in the world. Uh, but in fact, the Appalachian is Monterey and Santa Barbara County. And I think they actually say on the back, I knew I thought it said stuff like, actually I probably, I do have the text sheet. So here, let me go to the cheat sheet just for a second here. And I can tell you that it was 
uh, oh no, they're not going to tell me either. And no, in other years it said, it's like 56 and 38 uh, Monterey and, and Santa Barbara counties in there. And they talk about apricot, sweet peach, and tropical fruits in that. Low alcohol, 12.81, as you'd expect. Uh, high acidity, 0.66. And residual sugar, 2.66 grams per 100 milliliters, which means it's 2.6% sugar. And so that's why you are tasting, of course, the sugar in there, since perception is usually about a half percent. Okay? So that's the way that works. Uh, and so our wine, we have clarified it, settled it, then of course we have fined it, and then in many cases we have to filter it, and then of course finish the wine uh, after that. In other words, it could be aged, obviously it could be blended, it could be bottled in all of that. But to a great extent too, we are still not done. And in most cases, and especially in cool climate wines, and especially whites, in most cases we will also do cold stabilization. There are two acids in wine, tartaric acid or tartrates, basically the same stuff the cream of tartar is made of, and malic acid. Malic acid is the acid that's found in apples. The Latin name for apple is mollus, and so malic acid is the acid that is in there. Um, and I just remind myself to tell you one more thing too that I don't have in here, but I will. Um, cold, and what happens is, obviously, as the wine is being made, probably the lowest that wine has ever been temperature wise, oh, you know, might be 45 degrees or something as it's settling the juice. And so you make a wine out of it. And so then you have it. Well, if you take that bottle of wine and it has a tremendous amount of acid in it, as, as a number of grapes do, I can think of Riesling and Godeo and a number of other ones. If you take it home and you put it in the refrigerator for a few days, when you take that bottle out of the refrigerator, you would very often, especially in a German Riesling, you would find little white particulate matter at the bottom of that. And what that was, of course, is the tartaric acid, which fell out of solution. And so you had crystals of tartrates. It was so common in Germany that they called them Rheinsteins, rhinestones, uh, because it was. It will not hurt you, but people who did not know were a little freaked by having little pieces of stuff on the bottom of their glasses. So what they did, what you do is you cold stabilize. You take the wine, now finished wine, and you put it in a cold room, typically 27 degrees for a couple of weeks. And what happens is that forces the excess tartrates out of the wine, typically makes it a little less acidic also. But then they are not dealing with it when you get it home. And so you see, here's a picture, you can see that on there. Uh, and in fact, you see this gentleman is actually taking plates of tartrates off of the inside of that barrel. I have, in fact, at home, I had been at an Austrian, and in fact, I have some other ones from Alsace, uh, where they had used wines, barrels for storage for years and years and years. And they had literally two inch thick deposits of tartrates inside of those barrels. So it's just sort of amazing to see. So cold stabilization is what is done very often. The other thing, and of course, I probably will talk about it more when we do the reds on uh, November 13th. Uh, that is of course, when we will be doing the next one for here at Lane Library, um, is uh, malolactic fermentation. As I mentioned, Malic acid, malates, are the other acid in wine. And it's fairly sharp because it has two hydroxyl groups. So what happens is, is you can change it, again, it's a second fermentation, to lactic acid, which is the acid found in milk, and it softens and makes the wine more creamy. The only wine that they typically do that with, or if they do that with any white, it will be Chardonnay. Otherwise, but most reds actually go through malolactic fermentation, or as we normally call it, ML, since it's a lot easier than saying malolactic fermentation every time. So that's what goes on with that, okay? Um, we can do barrel aging, again, typically with Chardonnay, but you will also find it sometimes with Sauvignon Blancs, and again with blends, and of course white wines in, in Bordeaux, and of course white wines in Burgundy, we'll see extensive barrel aging. And so barrel aging can also be done to these wines also. Of course, that's before then blended and bottled is what you will find, okay?
So blending and bottling being basically sort of the, the last part uh, of that, okay? So that gets us to our fifth wine. And actually, uh, in fact, I should actually, again, have you go on chat and tell me, in fact, which wine you have. Uh, because as it often goes with the world of wine, and when it comes to ordering wine and doing classes like this, the only vintage, and in fact, you may all only have the only vintage that was around and available was the 17. But Today, the distributor told me that when they took wine to several places and they got more wine in, that they actually, in fact, are now on the 19. And I want you to notice several things about these wines, and then we'll talk about them too. Let's go back to the 17. You see, of course, it's in a green bottle, and it says Isle St. George. And of course, on your list, the wine that I told you about, and hopefully all of you have, is the 17 Isle St. George. And in fact, you have a little circle, which you see on the lower right-hand corner that says a state bottled. And that's because it came from North Bass or Isle St. George, which is the other name for North Bass Island that is done there. But the current release, which is now on the market, is this one. The color of the bottle is different. And it of course is 2019 and the vintage is different. But look at the other key difference. It says American. And what this tells me, and of course the problem is, and I tried to get information from Firelands, you know, I, I, you might as well get information from the Kremlin. Uh, they never tell me anything. And so, but it is now American. And that means that it is probably their grapes and a blend of grapes that they got from my guess would be Washington or Oregon, but I do not know that for sure because I could not get any information from them. So that's the thing. So I actually have a bottle of both so that I can also taste them side by side. And if any of you have the 19, we can talk about the 17 and the 19. So I'm going to go, first I'm gonna go back and look at this nice in the 17. And so let's taste the 2017, and I will stop sharing so we can do this, okay? So, here we go. Firelands, 2017 in the green bottle. And so, um, with this again, a very nice golden color. This happens to be a wine that I'm familiar with. And I will tell you, the reason I use this is because it has such excellent varietal character. This wine is Gewürztraminer. The grape, as you would find it in Alsace or Germany or whatever, it has excellent varietal character. And for an Ohio wine, I love showcasing it for that reason. So if you swirl and smell this wine, ah. I just love this wine. I, you know, it is so spicy, perfumed. It has that really, I'm not sure how I would describe it. Lychees, uh, again, uh, has certainly that in it. Roses, almost going to peonies. Very floral, just amazingly floral. Oh, just so neat. And if you taste this wine, It has that wonderful sort of bite of Gewurz, which again, makes it wonderful with Asian food. And of course, my heritage is, is Eastern European, Slavic. And so we always had pork and sauerkraut on, uh, on New Year's Day. And in Alsace, they make chocrut garni, which is basically pork and sauerkraut, sausages, etc. And it is with sauerkraut, those kinds of things, but with Asian food, Indian food, those kinds of things, as long as it's not too spicy, yum. It is just so good. And it really is. And so the 17, oh good, it's three years old. It's held up beautifully. I really think that that's a lovely wine. So let's see about the 19th. 
The 19, as you can see, in a totally different bottle. Color is definitely lighter, as I would expect. As you can see there, much, much lighter. There might be a little spritz to this wine. I can't be sure. But again, I will swirl and smell because this is a new one on me. I got this today uh, because it just came on the market today. Interesting. It's not as, it doesn't jump out of the glass as much as the previous wine does. As you swirl a bit more though, it's certainly identifiably Gewurztraminer, but shyer and more, more vegetal. I mean, it really almost has a bit of a grassy uh, character to it, but still nice. Now let's taste this wine. A little sweeter. Maybe doesn't have quite as much varietal character, but but very tasty. Ah, uh, yeah, I like it. Nice and spicy. I really like the spiciness of it. It's a little lighter than the 17, and part of that could be bottle age. And the other thing, of course, could be um, uh, obviously difference in vintage, and also American. Uh, I really have, I may have, to, I may have to call Mario myself and basically try to beat the information out of him. Uh, because I would really like to know, it's like, where do the grapes come from? I mean, it drives me crazy that they don't, that they don't tell you anything. And I've sold way too much of his wine not to know. Uh, I plan on telling him that. Uh, yeah, oh no, I like it. I like it, I like it just fine. Hmm. So let's see here, share screen. And share. So again, uh, that's a 17, and this is the 19 uh, there with the differences. Both low in alcohol, 12.5%. By the way, though, guilty sec silly secret that many people don't know in the wine industry, you literally have a percent leeway either way. So this wine could be as low as 11 and a half and high as 13 and a half, and that's okay, that's legal. And so you have a percent either way when it comes to that. Any questions, Sarah? Well, we had someone ask, you know, you, you ended talking about the bottling process. Someone asked about storing the wine mm -hmm. and does it have to be stored on the side mm -hmm. and locked and sealed? Sure, and that's a very good question. And that is probably like, I mean, let's face it. I mean, you know, the the wine industry is sometimes uh, overburdened with things that aren't quite true uh, all the time, and one and that is one of them. Um, Amarin, which are the like one of the major cork people, did a study all the way back in 2005, so 15 years ago. And for the most part, the word has not gotten out. And that is, you do not have to store wine on its side. The, the ullage, which is the specific term that we use for the headspace, the airspace at the top of the bottle. And actually it can be the top of a, of a tank or the top of a barrel or whatever. That's called ullage, U-L-L-A-G-E, um, is 100% relative humidity. And so the cork is not going to dry out any faster if it's on its side or if it is upright. And so that is not true. The important thing when it comes to storing wine is try to give it as an even temperature. Cooler is obviously better. You are going to, uh, 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 it, it's, you know, uh, is better. Uh, you don't want tremendous fluctuations in temperature. Uh, and so, um, uh, you don't want it in light, uh, and certainly not direct sunlight because it would heat it up and you don't really want spikes of temperature up and down. If it changes very slowly over time and again, which is why, you know, a cellar is always good 
uh, uh, you know, obviously basements, especially if it's soil, or, you know, a closet that you don't use, or things that don't get open and closed. You know, it's amazing. If you think back to the 80s and how often kitchens, you know, would have the wine racks up on the top, sometimes even on top above the stove, the, or above the refrigerator, which of course gives off heat, the worst place in the world to store wine. Uh, you know, and so that's in fact, so that's true for storage. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this in fact is Owl St. George where at least part of the grapes came from. Uh, I'm not sure they all did in the 19, but for the 17, they did. Uh, and so that's very true. And I thought this is a great picture. This is actually, and this was taken a while ago, but this is actually the grapes that are then put on a ferry because there's not a winery on North Bass. They then ferry the grapes across to put in bay where they are then processed. Uh, and so that's where the Firelands Winery is down in those areas, okay? Um, so any more questions? Then that brought about the question about corks. Sure. Corks versus your screw caps. Um, and that's a very good question. Um, Let's face it, 95% of all wines should be drunk within one to three years of bottling, meaning that they're meant for early consumption. And that's not to say that these wines here, I would certainly say the Black Stallion would last. I would certainly not have a problem having more of these wines for up to five years, but you really do want to taste them young when they're young, when they have all the fresh fruit, etc. And so a screw cap is fine. Cork is also, but cork tends to be more expensive. And luckily this problem has not, is not completely gone away, but it's going away. Some wines, when we have like the Black Stallion, when it has a cork in it, we say that that wine is cork finished. And the thing is, it's another one of those things that people don't realize, is even though it makes a wine tight seal, a little bit of oxygen can get through that cork into the wine. And so it is often thought that that light, tiny bit of oxygen, micro oxygenation, will allow the wine to age. And in fact, they now make screw caps that will allow a little bit of air to get through for that very reason, but extremely small amounts. So I'm not sure one is better than the other. I mean, Plump Jack has been putting their extremely expensive wine in screw cap and cork for a very long time. But again, what you find is that, um, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. I always laugh, in fact, some of you, especially your collectors are maybe familiar with, um, and of course, now that I said, I'm gonna remember his name, I have to remember his name. Um, oh, it'll come to me. Um, has in fact plastic or rub or wax, over his corks and his wines take forever to age and so that's sort of uh, amazing uh, for that so it's sort of interesting uh, along those lines uh, with that so that in fact is that uh, anything else uh, there was a question about sorry uh, firelands how far north that is is it common for vineyards we always think of California warm what about vineyards like northern, is that is uh, northern Ohio, yeah. So, yeah, near Sandusky. We have to realize it's the lake. When I teach the class, we talk about macro climate, which is basically, you know, what it has. And of course, in California would typically be a very Mediterranean hot climate, except for the cool oceans nearby. And so for the most part, they can grow relatively cool climate grapes. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, even Cabernet is not that warm a climate grape. Up in the north, because of the lake modifying the temperature, there's a much longer growing season. And especially being surrounded by water as North Bass is. And so even though they're further north, you have the lake modifying the temperature. And because of that modification of the temperature, that's what's going on. Okay. So again, um, uh, that, and I'm certainly happy to answer questions. This is the end. Uh, I really want to thank the Friends of Lane Library again. I especially want to thank Sarah, who's here, and Andrew Wilson for all of the expertise that he has given us. Um, and one last thing, because it just came across my phone, and it is sort of on a sad note, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg has just passed away. And I would like to toast a wonderful woman. Cheers, all.
Any questions? A lot of kudos. People are very thankful for your presentation. Thank you all. It is always fun to do these things, and it's really wonderful to know that you're out there enjoying it. And so that's why I am so happy to do it. And the Lang Library, of course, is a wonderful treasure here in Butler County, and I want to thank them again. If there are no other questions, I will sign off. We good? Yeah. Great. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Sorry that that just... Nice job, Jack.